Our reading this morning is in Habakkuk chapter 1 through to chapter 2 and verse 5, and also Galatians 3, 7 to 14. Hear God's word. The oracle of the ha- of the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? O cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astonished. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress. For they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. And you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallow up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer concerning my complaint. And the righteous answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man 
who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he is never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. And into to Galatians chapter 3, reading from verse 7 to 14. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise, the promised spirit, through faith. May the Lord add his blessing to, the, to those readings from his holy word. Well, good morning. It's good to be back amongst you. And uh, Pastor Peter, dear old friend of mine from way, way back, has asked me to um, be with you for these next, uh, these three weeks. So you've got me. And so what I'd like to do over these next three weeks is bring you what I'm calling postcards from the prophets. And this morning we're going to look at Habakkuk. Next week we'll look at Nahum. And on the third week we'll look at Hosea and see what they have to say to us. So as we come to the preached word, let us again pray together. Gracious and Holy Father, as we come, we thank you that you have granted us your word in our hands. And as we come before it, we pray that you would grant us humble and teachable hearts. Keep us from a presumptuous spirit that we might hear what you have to say and all of us would be humbled before the person who you are and the person who you reveal in this word which you have granted. We thank you for your mercy and grace and pray that your spirit would be pleased to attend us, that we might rightly understand your word of truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as this year starts, what questions do you have? As you look out on a world that is, seems to be racked by violence, lawlessness, Justice seems to be perverted, and people are in pain. As we consider what's going to happen tomorrow, it's been said that growing old is it takes courage, and it does, because we're not quite sure how our body is going to hang up together this year. We're not quite sure about what's going to happen with our loved ones, and we're concerned about that. You see, when we had our own children and they were very young, they were some, as they grew, they became heavy to hold. But as you get older and they get older, the heaviness is not so much in their weight, but is in the weight of our hearts, concerned for their future and their well-being. So as you come into this year, what questions do you have? Do you wrestle with? Do you wonder about? For that matter, what about your complaints? And let's be honest, we have them.
Do we own them? Do we understand them? You see, Habakkuk didn't understand what was going on in his day. He struggled with it. He had questions. He expressed his complaints. But the interesting thing about this prophecy is that God does not reprove him for his questions or his complaints. There is nothing wrong with asking God why. The issue is, what's our heart attitude as we ask? That's more the issue. Will we shake our fist in the face of God? Or will we seek to understand and seek his perspective? Will we come humbly? Or will we come arrogantly with our questions? This prophecy of Habakkuk is quite unusual in terms of prophecies of the Old Testament because Habakkuk isn't proclaiming anything to anybody. Rather, it is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God himself. But yet it is here in our word because the Spirit of God deems it fit that we too should understand what it is to wrestle with God with things we don't understand and to give us an example of how we should respond, how we should look to him for hope. God is big enough to deal with our questions and our complaints. God comes and says in the end to Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. But lest we be tempted to follow the thinking of the world, biblical faith is not fatalistic. It is not blind. Because God will give evidence of himself as to why we should believe and how we should believe. We are not left in blind darkness. God reveals the truth about himself through his word that our faith may be based in the reality of his revelation. So do you have questions? I'm sure you do. Do you have complaints? I'm sure you do. Let's own them. Let's own them together and seek to encourage one another as we wrestle through the circumstances that we face in this coming year. This morning I want to consider Habakkuk and his circumstance and his example and interwoven with that is God's answers to his questions and his complaint. And then thirdly, I want to consider how the New Testament authors apply the text of Hebrews 2.4, that the righteous shall live by faith. What does it mean to be righteous? What does it mean to have faith? And what does it mean to live by that faith? That's where we're going. Let's consider... Habakkuk and the oracle that he saw. This relates to a period of the late 7th century BC. See, it has a historical setting. This is real life. This isn't imaginary. This isn't a vision. This is a reality what he needed to deal with. Most likely from 640 onwards, why? Because the Assyrians who had devastated the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 and taken the northern kingdom into exile were moving now further into the south, into Judah. But at the same time, God is raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. Another name for the Chaldeans. And God is going to use the Babylonians to discipline Assyria and to discipline Judah. This prophecy of Habakkuk relates to this period of time when God is going to raise up the Babylonians as a rod of his justice. 
In the late 7th century, there was a king called Jehoiakim who was in control from 609 to 598. And in his reign, Judah became more and more immoral with great spiritual deterioration. So much so, we see in the first in chapter one of Habakkuk in the first four verses, we see the concern that Habakkuk has. O oh Lord, how sh- how long shall I cry for help, and will you not hear? Or will you cry violence, and you will not save? It was a violent time. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Why do you put up with it? Why won't you do something about it? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law lies paralyzed. Justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Does that reflect something of our day as well? If we're honest. And you see Habakkuk saying, God, why aren't you acting? What's wrong here? This apparent silence and idleness of yours is upsetting. I want you to do something. The Lord answers, verse 5. Look among the nations and see and wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Wow. Okay. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Now notice God's own description of the people that he's raising up. They are a hasty and bitter nation. who march through the breadth of the earth and seize dwellings not their own. They are a violent people, an invading force. Then it describes how they do it. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their horses are swifter than leopards. Their horsemen come from afar. Verse 9, they come for violence. All their faces are forward, and they gather captives like sand. Think of the Middle East. Who does this remind you of? At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh, and they laugh at every fortress, and they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. This is the Lord's description of the Chaldeans, guilty men whose own might is their God. Habakkuk's concerned about lawlessness in Judah. Lord, why aren't you doing something about it? I am, I'm raising the Chaldeans, and this is the type of people that they are. They are guilty, and they are worshipping their own might, their own violence, and they will do it their way. So this puts Habakkuk in even a deeper place of concern. And so we have his second complaint from verse 12 onwards. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? See, Habakkuk knows God at a personal level. And for him, God is holy. God is his God. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. He submits to what God is doing. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallow up a man more righteous than he? Lord, I know that I am not righteous. I know that my people are not righteous. But why do you use people who are even more wicked to reprove us? 
How does this work? What are you doing? And then he does this. Look at what Habakkuk does in chapter 2 and verse 1. See, he's wrestling. He's wrestling with God about what he sees around about him in his circumstance. And he says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on a tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk knows that he doesn't understand everything. He does know that God is sovereign and holy and righteous and is acting rightly. But Habakkuk knows that he doesn't understand that, how that works. But he says, I will wait. And I will wait to see what he says to me. And I will wait to see what answer he gives to my complaint. Do you see the humility of this guy? This isn't shaking the fist in the face of God. There is a humility here that he is prepared to wait. His attitude is acknowledging that him as a finite creature is standing on his tower before an infinite God. And he's prepared to wait. And that's one of the hardest things that we have to do. We don't know what that cancer treatment will work out at. We don't know how that grandchild will grow up. What will be their heart attitudes? Which way they will go in life? We don't know what will happen to our young teenagers who appear at times to fall off the road. We just need to be there for them with open hearts and open hands. But as we wait, where is our confidence? For Habakkuk, his confidence was in his God, my God, my Lord, my Holy One. His confidence is in the character of God. And God answers him from uh, chapter 2, verse 2, right through to the end of that chapter. And he says in verse, three, uh, in verse 2, write the vision, make it plain. God wants people to know who he is and who's in control. So we have these writing prophets as a testimony to the people that God has said and God will fulfill it in his time. And then we notice here in verse 3, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. There is a time that it is appointed there is a time that all things will give an account. It hastens to an end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. Context here, he's referring to the Chaldeans and their attitude. But what about you, Habakkuk? The righteous shall live by faith. That's the issue. In the face of you not knowing, in the face of your questions, in the face of your complaints, the righteous shall live by faith in God, who is the Lord, who is the Holy One, who will ordain things for the right time. The wicked are marked by arrogance and pride, but the righteous shall live by faith. This was the challenge to Habakkuk and to those who heard his prophecy. It's the challenge to us. 
So from verse 6 of chapter 2 right through to the end, we have God pronouncing judgment on the Chaldeans. And he does it by way of six woes. And you can really leave you to read that, that chapter. But look at verse 18. What profit is an idol? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. For the Babylonians, their idol was power, force, violence. They ruled by violence. Their idol was that. They made it. They trusted in it something of their own creation. But for all of us, verse 20 needs to be taken seriously. The Lord is in his holy temple. It may appear otherwise, but the testimony of Habakkuk here is the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Do not be so hasty as to presume and to verbalize it without seeking to understand who is really in control. So God declares this. This is God's declaration in chapter 2. The whole of the chapter is what God says to Habakkuk in answer to his complaint. And chapter 3 is Habakkuk's response to God. Verse 2 of chapter 3. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Go to verse 16. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet... I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people, to come upon, sorry, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. So what he's wanting now is hearing God's word, he waits even though it scares him. He waits for the invasion but he also waits for God's justice to bring about recompense for those who invade them. And then we have this famous prayer in his rejoicing in these last verses in chapter 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, and the produce of the olive fail, and the yield, fields yield no fruit, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. God alone enables him to stand. His strength to face the future to face the unknown, to face, even though he has been warned of imminent invasion, to face that and the fear of that. He says, the Lord, my God, is my strength. How else are you going to face the diagnosis of cancer? How else are you going to face, even worse for you as an individual, the diagnosis of some illness of your new grandchild? Or some sudden car accident? Or something which comes out of the blue which we do not expect? Where is our faith placed? That's the issue. For Habakkuk, his faith 
was placed in God. He was told, in effect, that the judge of all the earth will do right, that salvation belongs to God alone. The issue is now, will he act on that? God has written down this promise. God has asked Habakkuk specifically to write it down. And in one sense, God gets it written down because he's prepared to be accountable for what he says. He's prepared to keep the promise that he's made. Otherwise, we could say, well, Lord, you didn't do it. But God has it written down and we have it in our hands. There is our confidence. And for Habakkuk, who is writing in the latter part of the 7th century, history proves it true. The Babylonians destroyed the Assyrians. They then moved down into Judah, and they took some folk captive out of Jerusalem in 605, probably Daniel and his mates. Then they came back in 597 and they took a bunch of other people, including Ezekiel. And then they came back a third time in 586 and completely destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple and took away almost everybody into Babylonia. God's judgment fell on a rebellious people of Judah. And yet Habakkuk said in chapter 3 and verse 16 that he will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon those who invade us. So in 586, they destroy Jerusalem and all the people are taken into Babylon. However, God raises up the Persians by 539 and they destroy the Babylonians. God holds the Babylonians to account and in 539 the Persians take over Babylonia. And the Persian king Cyrus the following year in 538 declares that the Jews can return to Palestine. And God redeems a people out of the exile. And there is a second exodus. And God brings them back. You see, history testifies to the truth of the word. God kept his promise to Habakkuk. The righteous shall live by faith. But what about our questions? Who is this righteous person? And how can this person be righteous before such a holy God? And as he exercises faith, what is this faith and how does it function? How shall this righteous person live by this faith? How does that work before God? Well, the New Testament writers pick up this statement, the righteous shall live by faith three times. The first one we find in Romans in chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17. And Paul uses this text, the righteous shall live by faith, as a commentary on righteousness revealed, the gospel revealed. Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, he says, for it is the power of God for salvation to every 
one who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The whole of Romans is a commentary on how that works out. God's revealed his righteousness in the person and work of Christ, in that good news. Righteousness is found in him. How are we right with God? Not on the basis of what we do or what we think or who we are, but on the basis of what he has done, on the basis of who he is, on the basis of his beloved son. The Lord Jesus. We can only be right with God through Christ. The book of Hebrews declares the fact that there is a necessity of having faith in the Lord Jesus and in him only. The book of Hebrews suggests that Jesus is superior to angels and to Moses that he has a superior priesthood, a superior sacrifice, a superior covenant, that faith is to be centered on him and him alone and to be evidenced by action. So Hebrews in chapter 10 and verses 35 to 11 and verse 1. Verse 35 of Hebrews 10, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when we have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The writer to the Hebrews is talking here in this particular context about Christ coming again, the day will not delay. We have to live and walk by faith, looking to that day of the second coming. We are not called to a blind leap of faith. Habakkuk wasn't called to a blind leap of faith. Habakkuk was called to trust God on the basis of the evidence of who God is. And for us, we can see historically that all that he said to Habakkuk has come about. So when we look to Christ coming again, we have to trust the same God for the truth that he has already declared and has written down as assurance of promise that he will keep it. As Tim Keller says, we're not called to the leap of faith. We're called to a faith that seeks understanding. Seeking to understand what God is doing in our time and in our day, being alert, being aware, being active, being engaged. Faith is not blind. Faith is acting. Biblical faith is acting on the basis of the revelation which God has already made. And Paul in Galatians says that once you start on this track of living a life of faith in the personal work of Christ, then you must continue in it. The Galatians were seeking to add law and ceremony to their faith because they considered that they wanted to be sure that they were right with God. But Paul says no. 
Have a look at Galatians 3 and verses 10 and 11. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide in all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified, no one is made right, no one is declared right before God by law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But notice verses 12 to 14. The law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Paul wants them to live on the basis of what God has already declared. He promised it to Abraham in Genesis 12. He promised and kept it in the coming of his son. And his son comes and sends the spirit that we might be enabled to believe. Faith comes in the completed work of Christ as God has revealed it. You see, for Habakkuk, God said, the righteous shall live by faith in Jehovah as Lord, Judge, Redeemer, and Savior. For us, this side of Calvary, this side of Pentecost, God says, the righteous shall live by his faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, Judge, Redeemer, and Savior. So let us not be afraid to bring, bring our questions. God is big enough. He has kept his word. It has been written down, and he has fulfilled it and will fulfill it. The issue is, will we be like Habakkuk? and stand in our tower, metaphorically speaking, and wait. Today the challenge really from Habakkuk is where do you put your faith? Where do you put your trust? In whom do you hope? And with what attitude do you come and ask your questions or raise your complaints? As we start this new year, let us seek to encourage one another to exercise faith in God's written word, which we have in our hands, and in God's word made flesh, the person and work of Christ. For he alone makes us right with him, that we might live to him and might live for him. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you that history has declared and evidenced the fact that you have kept your word. And Father, while we look to the future and we know of your promises yet to come, we have confidence that you will keep them because you have kept them in the past. Christ has come, and he will come again. So, Father, as we wrestle with the unknown, as we wrestle with uncertainty on a daily basis, as we wrestle with concerns of what we see going on about us and we do not comprehend it, we struggle to understand why you allow some things to happen. Father, we pray that you would grant us humble hearts, that we would follow Habakkuk's example, that we would look to you, that you would be our strength, and these mountains that we are standing on, that we can stand on them with a surety, because you enable us to stand. Father, grant us humble and teachable hearts, 
particularly as we cannot understand all that is before us. As finite creatures before an infinite God, we thank you for your grace and in wrath we ask, Father, remember mercy. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen.